Welcome everybody live to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. We are so excited to have one of our great guests making a return visit to JMS, the Gym Master Show. Herbie J. Pilato is joining us here from California, from LA, author, producer, TV historian, pop culture expert, actor as well, and he's going back into acting real soon. We'll tell you about that. That's a little teaser there for you. We're celebrating Sean Connery, of course, James Bond, 007, with his fabulous book and so much more. Connery, Sean Connery is penned by Herbie J. Pilato. We're going to talk about this. It's an extraordinary work. It's very popular. And of course, if you know his work, you know he is a prolific writer. He has I tell you, the amount of material that he produces is extraordinary. You think you've just read one book and that's good for the year, and he comes out with another one on all the favorites from television and movies, pop culture, and so much more. And it's a real honor and a pleasure to have an opportunity to celebrate this iconic actor. Now, what uh, our friend did, uh, Herbie, is he really took a deep dive into the life and career of this iconic actor, and he did it in a way that's just so absolutely incredible. Uh, you are going to be riveted because it's really before, during, and after his major historic role. You know him, of course, as uh, Bond, but there's so much more that he's done in his career, and Herbie's touched upon it in such a beautiful way with this book right here showing you on the screen right there. There it is. And it's an incredible read, folks. I encourage you to get it. We'll tell you how you can get it. And all the other books in the collection. Of course, you know, we talked extensively about Elizabeth Montgomery. He is one of the most incredible Elizabeth Montgomery aficionados. You've seen him on television. You've seen him, you know, on talk shows. He's just been everywhere. And we're so excited in his very busy time right now to have a few moments with, with Herbie coming to us again from California. I don't want to go into a whole big thing because he was here with us before. And I encourage you to see the previous episode. It was uh, really a terrific conversation. I want to have as much time with Herbie as possible. So I'm going to bring him right on. First, gang, if you would like to comment, interact with us here on the Gym Master Show Live, we're very interactive. You can comment in the JMS Lovety Hole chat room when you subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Gym Masters TV. We've done well over 1,010 episodes of this series in just three and a half years. I cannot believe it. That's a lot of talking, a lot of good interaction, and a lot of great entertainment with all of you here on JMS. So thanks uh, again for everybody who's already commenting, saying hello. We really appreciate that. It's good to see you watching all around the world. Now, without further ado in his office, surrounded by his work, his love. Herbie is joining us here on the show once again as a return guest. Herbie, welcome back to the Gym Master Show. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you here, my friend. Thank you, Jim. A thousand episodes? <laughs> thousand and ten. What, what companion book could I write that would cover that? That's amazing. <laughs> Masters, James Masters. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's absolutely, you know, when uh, the viewers reminded me too, they were, they've been counting up the episodes and like, you've reached about a thousand plus, which we did uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it really is incredible. And the thing about it, as you know, in life, because you and I were just chatting about, you're going to be uh, acting again, which is really exciting as soon as the strike ends. Yeah. And uh, so as soon as that happens, so how do you find time to do everything that you do as well? I thought I was always busy with all the hats I wear in the industry. Well, I don't sleep. <laughs> you too, huh? <laughs> no, no. Coffee doesn't even work anymore. <laughs> well, if I do sleep, somehow it's between, because I go to bed early and I get up and I get up early and I get up early. So it's like 8, 8, 8 p.m. at night and then I'm up at 3 and then I'm shot by 11, then I take a nap and try to do some things after that. But my key hours are 3 to 11 a.m. 3 to 11 a.m. Wow. <laughs> Those are the real productive, uh, you know, so you are a night owl. Yeah, I'm, yeah. A, I'm a night owl morning person, definitely. You know, a lot of people, I had a friend, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, but he was a uh, 
we lost him early. We lost him when he was 27, but he was a screenwriter in New York and he would wake up at two in the morning out of a sleep, run right to his typewriter <laughs> and would have these incredible ideas for screenplays and you know movie scripts and all this cool stuff. But the difference is, he never thought enough of himself and was he had such a fear of rejection so mm. much he never submitted or sent and then you'd find ironically that happening on screen or on stage two years later mm. and similar sort of concept mm. do you ever you know what that is you know what that is yeah. when when those thoughts when i this is how i look at it when thoughts and ideas come to you those are whispers of ideas from the universe that are designated for you. And if you don't take that opportunity from the ethers, somebody else will at some point, and you will deny yourself that opportunity and not only deny yourself, but deny others from benefiting from that. So it, he passed them by. And so the universe moved on and somebody else picked them up. <clears throat> Have you ever done that? Have you ever had something where you you say, "Gee, I wish I wrote that, or I submitted it, or why didn't I, you know, act on it quicker?" If it's something really topical, do you ever have that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've had that, and then I've also seen ideas of mine that I've shared with others at some point, uh, in some yeah. way that were just lifted from me. So that. Uh. That upset me more. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's an unfortunate part of some of what goes on in the world uh, mm -hmm. in these industries. Mm -hmm. um, well, congratulations first on the fact that you're going back into acting as well, and yeah. we'll, we'll see how you you juggle that. And you know, keep me posted. I'm happy yeah. for you. What made you decide? What inspired you to decide to want to go back into acting uh, once things you know sort of calm down? Well. You know, it was acting and, and singing and performing really were my first loves before the writing. The writing took over when um, I broke my toe back in 85 and I couldn't really go anywhere. And I started watching Bewitched and I was inspired by that. But also, too, because I was caring for my parents. Um, I went back to Rochester, New York, my hometown. And so I kind of like put the acting on hold. And I thought, well, if I'm going to still somehow try and be connected to Hollywood, at least I can do that writing and writing from anywhere. And then kind of things just kind of exploded. And the writing wouldn't let me go. And I kept on doing more and more and more. And I was requested to do more and more and more. So now that I've interviewed everybody I've wanted to interview and wrote about everybody I wanted to write about, I'm like, okay, maybe I should get back into acting and that's what I'm doing. So you've pretty much touched upon all the people that have interested you, huh, to write about? I mean, pretty much. I mean, unless somebody offers me a $3 million contract a day. Then you um, might uh, <laughs> take a day or two and put pen to paper, right? <laughs> what are, I know we briefly talked about some of it, but how are you inspired? Are these people that you've always admired, you've always found fascinating, you've always wanted to dig a little deeper and sort of tell their stories? Because you have a unique way of telling their stories and celebrating them, you know, warts and all, in a way that makes you feel like you almost know them or that we are in the room with you as you're writing. It's a very um, specific and uh, extraordinary way to write. It isn't just a typical situation. I'll read the book. Okay. That's all I figured to I'd find out about it. You have a way of bringing us in. Tell us about that process and the people that you have selected over the years to really celebrate and feature. Are these people you enjoy or that you think the public would enjoy, or is it really a combo? Of I, I guess it's a combination of everything. I mean, I always loved classic TV. That was my thing. You know, just I, I made it my thing anyway. And really about three years ago during the pandemic, I was as done as I say I'm done now with writing. And my agent said to me, well, you should really expand and go beyond television and into film. You know, start, is there anybody that, you know, you're interested in in the movies who you'd like to write about? And literally, we looked at the news that day and we thought, OK, who, who passed away? Who's in the news? And Sean Connery and Dinah Rigg, even though she's TV gear, too, she expanded into film. Um, 
we picked those two to do biographies on. And I got proposals together and we sold them within a very short period, within weeks, really. Um, also to a Lucas Spielberg book, a Lucas a Spielberg book that I'm working on. Um, that was the third project we sold. Um, and as far, as far as my approach, there are a lot of different Sean Connery biographies out there. And I did not want to repeat what everybody else did. And a lot of James Bond books, too, in general. So I wanted to cover um, his life from a different perspective uh, regarding his early life and his films and his his work beyond James Bond. Other books did movies about him. Other books did his Bond movies. Other books did his life with talking about his. I wanted to cover the whole spectrum um, as in depth as I could. And that's when I reached out to Richard DeMarco, who is his lifelong friend from Scotland, uh, to write the introduction and also to inter interview him. And um, Barbara Carrera, who wrote the foreword to the book. Uh, she was Sean's co-star from Never Say Never Again, which, by the way, this is the 40th anniversary of Never Say Never Again, his final film as, as Bond. And this is also the 60th anniversary of From Russia uh, With Love, which was his favorite Bond movie of his. What are some additional things in, in doing your research? Because I know you really craft and weave a fabulous tale, a wonderful story, and you take time to really dig in and tell it in such an eloquent way, Harvey. And that's why I love talking about these books. Uh, what are some things that you learned along the way in writing and researching the, about Sean Connery that maybe surprised you? I loved his humor, you know, he really, I mean, when he first got the role as James Bond, you know, he loved it. He became a superstar, yada, yada, yada. And then after a couple of movies, it was like, eh, you know, I can't take this. Uh, I want to get away from it. And he learned to hate and he came to hate James Bond. But he always came back to it one way or the other, certainly before the end of his life. And then towards the end of his life, really, and I, I don't want to just say towards the end, but I'd say the last 15 20 years of his life, he really took a, a great sense of humor about himself and that role. And that was too because he established himself beyond the part. Um, so his sense of humor was something that struck me. And also his generous, uh, kind heart into helping those with his own nonprofit organization, which was dedicated to helping the less fortunate or aspiring um, um, young people in Scotland, his, his homeland of Scotland. So he was a very, very complex guy. He was also very dedicated to his craft. He was self-taught as an actor, really. And he studied the classics, Shakespeare and, you know, Ibsen and all of those. And he really delved into it. And the writing was very important to him. So he would not do a part unless it was, you know, strongly uh, written. And what I really disappoints me about him is that he did not do um, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, which was taken over by George Lazenby. And he returned to the role afterwards in Diamonds Are Forever. But he didn't do a, what I think is one of the better Bond movies that would have been great with him. And it was strange because in that film, James Bond does have more character development. He marries Dina Rigg, of all people. He gets married. So Sean's big thing was, you know, the character was not developed enough. And here he was. De the character was developed and he doesn't do the movie. So I don't know. It was just very disappointing that he didn't do that. Cause I think it would have been terrific, even yeah, better yeah. with him. It, you know, that's a great idea. I, I agree with that. It would be, you know, the, you, when you did the digging and you put everything together with this book, Herbie, you also had an opportunity to talk to other of his friends and cohorts too. Exclusive commentary from actors like Brendan Lynch, yep. another of Connery's uh, lifelong friends, Luciana yep. Aluzzi, Thunderball, Tippi Hedren, Marnie, and, and many more. Tell us about what that was like, reaching out to others and gathering their commentary and thoughts, because I know that could be an arduous process. It can, and you know, you can't, when you can't get, I, I really, really wanted to talk with uh, Ursula Andress. Um, and there was a point where she was going to, and then she was gonna, and she was going to, and then she wasn't. But 
the others really filled in the space. And Luciana, you know, was Paluzzi is just amazing, gorgeous. I just saw her at the Hollywood show. I was with some of the Bond girls there, um, you know, signing my book and they were doing their stuff with the photos and whatnot. But yeah, I definitely enjoyed um, the whole process of talking with them. And you try to reach out to as many people as possible. You know, at least I do when I do a book like this, especially when there's been so many other books about, you know, the subject that you pick, you want to make yours different. So I wanted, definitely wanted fresh commentary. And what I really, really enjoyed hearing is that these women like Barbara Carrera and Luciana, they adored Sean, absolutely loved him. You know, he had uh, so much respect for them. This is what they told me. And that he was wonderful to work with and yada, yada, yada. So, you know, as we know, Sean had some issues uh, in the news. You know, his, his first wife wrote that, that book about how he abused her. And, you know, he said some not so wonderful things or about expressing himself with women. And he made some mistakes, you know, and the James Bond character of his era was not exactly the most respectful guy of, of women. And the character changed over the years. But you have to look at things in the context of time and of, of the era and, and who he was and his background. He was a came from a struggling background. I'm not justifying, you know, whatever issues that some women had with him. But I'm just trying to give the big picture of, of who he was. He came from a tough background. He he was a fighter, a street fighter his whole life. That probably contributed in some way to his toughness and perfection as being cast as Bond. Um, but overall, he was one wonderful human being who was just as complicated as the rest of us. He was just as flawed as the rest of us. How long did it take to actually write the book, you know, have the germ of the idea, get it going and then complete it to where you said, this is good. I've done my job. It's as good as it's going to get maybe a couple of rewrites. When did you, uh, what was that process like for you, Herbie? Well, let's see. We sold it in uh, 2020, the November, 2020 around there. And it took me about a year and a half to get the, the gist of what I wanted to say, but I really wasn't happy with it. Um, even after that year and a half, I, and I had others read it and they said, made some suggestions and, you know, so it took a while, really, I'd say about, about two years before I really got, um, you know, I was pleased with, with what I finally ultimately completed. And then, you know, you, the whole process of submitting it, to the publisher and having them make their comments and their additions and then sending it back to you and you filling in what give them what they want. It's a process. Publishing just doesn't happen you know, overnight unless you self publish. It's a whole other thing, you know, but I've always worked in, in the traditional way with publishers and you're dealing with editors and you want to, you know, make sure that everybody's happy and because publishing is a group effort. You know, and there's a lot of people that you have to please and compromise with and make sure. And, you, you know, you don't want to lose yourself, but you want to be as professional as you can and yet not not do the book that you want to do. Our special guest is Herbie J. Pilato. He's author of several renowned media Italian books, of course, such as Retroactive Television, The 12 Best Secrets of Christmas, biographies of Mary Tyler Moore, Elizabeth Montgomery, many others. He's written for the Television Academy and Emmys.com, served as host and co-executive producer of Amazon Prime's hit classic TV talk show, Then Again, with Herbie J. Pilato, and has produced, written, and appeared on countless documentaries for TV networks like CNN, Reels, Bravo, TLC, E!, a and E and various DVD Blu-ray releases. You're having a good time, aren't you, my friend? I am. <laughs> you made me realize that just now. Like, wow. <laughs> I did that. I did that. I did that. You know, <laughs> we uh, when I did a little thing like that in the beginning of having, uh, you might have seen it. Of course, legendary and the ever effervescent, wonderful Ruta Lee on just a couple of nights ago. It was her return visit. And I did the little intro, you know, talking about her epic career and, of course, everything about her. When she first came on <laughs> with her deadpan delivery just before she was leaving to go to Mexico, she says, that was the best damn obituary I've ever heard. 
<laughs> and when that time comes, I want you to do it. Did you record it? <laughs> I love Ruta. She's fantastic, isn't she? I love oh her. Oh my God, she's fantastic. Uh, she did a Christmas special like 20 years ago uh, with Ray Campanella. No, not Ray Campanella. Yeah, Roy, Ray, Ray Campanella. I get the Campanella's confusing, please. Or Joe me. or? Joe, Joe Campanella. Yeah. And, and it was a little Christmas video special that was on some little network. And it was the most touching thing. I was in the last few months of caring for my mom back in New York. And I watched it, you know, during that time. And it just hit home because it was so perfect. And I, I had the opportunity to meet her at the Hollywood Museum or something. And I told her about that. And she said something like, I told her how much I loved her and in that, in that little clip. And, and she's like, honey, consider your your ass kissed <laughs> <laughs> the which title is the title of, her of her book or something yes right? yes this is <laughs> i tell you and uh and she did that and i felt the tingle when she did it <laughs> <laughs> hey we've got somebody watching who's a mutual friend he was also a guest on our show he's a pal of yours too nick santa maria nick herbie is my pal and one of the nicest people in the world a vintage showbiz history, and he loves my William Demarest and Fred McMurray oh, imitations. Absolutely. <laughs> we, I, during my live events in Burbank, which led to my show, uh, I, I hosted a live events at the Burbank Barnes and Noble from 2000, from July 2000, 2015 to December. And Nick showed up and he stood up and he asked a question. I said, you can, I will not give you the answer unless you do your Fred McMurray imitation. And he did it. And the, the audience there adored him and, you know, just applied. And it was wonderful. And I answered his question. But Nick is a special guy. He really is. Yeah. He's one of those special people. Absolutely. Bye, Nick. <laughs> yes, Nick, it's good to see you here and a big supporter of the show. He um, He's just a really, really great guy. He loves everything Abbott and Costello, of course, yep. too. Sure. And um, yeah, you can see that episode on our YouTube channel, folks, and the binge. We had Chris Costello on with him as well. Of course, oh, awesome. daughter of Lou Costello. That was an epic episode. Can you do any impressions? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, actually. Kirk. Kirk, oh, Captain Kirk. When he first uh, sees Spock um, in the Star Trek, the motion picture, after 15 years in Star Trek time, Spock walks onto the bridge and Kirk turns and he says, Spock. And that's it. <laughs> Beam me up, Herbie. <laughs> Hey, I wanted to mention too, and I know you really wanted to be a part of it, but you got called away. You had deadlines. And when we did our tribute uh, celebrating Bob Barker, yeah, right. And we had Roger Neal on and Wake Martindale and Randy West and several other great Wesley Wyatt, Hyatt, uh, so many others. Um, did you want to say anything about uh, Bob Parker and yeah, I do. I actually, I was, I had interviewed him about five years ago for an article that I was going to do for the um, television Academy. And he was, I don't know. He passed away at 94 or something, right? How old was he? He made it to 99, just a couple oh. months shy of his hundredth. Okay. So I was talking to him when he was 92. He didn't miss I think. I mean, he had it. He was still all together. And we were talking about truth or consequences, which was, of course, before he became the phenomenon and the price is right. A truth or consequences I was to me was such a cozy show. I used that word with him and he just loved that I described it like that because it he had that way about him that you may he, he made you feel like he was, you know, just talking to you in your living room, like if he, he was three dimensional. He was a sweetheart, down to earth, and he took his public persona and he did something positive with it, you know, with the animal advocacy and all of that. He used his public persona for some kind of betterment of humanity. Absolutely right. Do you, uh, of course, they just tore down the, the Warner slash Columbia Ranch and they took down, you know, the Roger Genie House, Hazel, Gidget, the Bewitched the House, which was also Dr. Bellow's house. How do you feel about that? I know progress, technology, new studios, high tech. Do you think it, it 
could have been any way they could have moved those facades, moved those houses, made a museum out of it, done something. Uh, it was a shame to see the video and see the clips of it being literally, there's one where you just drone right over the bewitched house and you see, you know, the demolition right in front of your eyes. And you're like, oh my God, <laughs> childhood's being erased. What's going on here? How did you feel about it? I bet it was, it's no, mixed. I, don't, I mean, I had the opportunity several times to visit, you know, that street of dreams really is what it was. And there should have been another way. I'm sorry. There, there should have been another way. We're talking about history here, living history, whether they were just fake facades or not, you know, you'd walk through the door and you just see nothing, but just that neighborhood was an amazing thing. And there could have been another way. Now it's very, it's very disturbing that that happened. Uh, there's progress and then there's not progress. And to right. me, that was not progress. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a tough thing. Do you like also, I, I wanted to, I was thinking about this uh, earlier. I wanted to ask this of you. Um, do you like when people, you know, you see a lot of stuff online, videos and all kinds of stuff that people make. Uh, some people you've heard of that are doing it. Some people you've never heard of them and they're just doing it. Random videos and things where they're, taking these like iconic figures, iconic shows, you know, beloved things of that nature. And they're dissecting them in ways where they're looking for the dirt. They're looking for where there was strife, where there wasn't friendliness on the set, where it was, you know, disastrous and this one hated this one. And then where it sort of like dismantles what you have felt and that feeling you felt about that series, about those people knowing, you know, behind the curtain, behind the wall, there are times I've even found, and I know like you working in these industries that if you're on a stage, all you have to do is go behind the wall and you'll see wires and cables and boxes and props. That's just the way it works. But sometimes there's those who like to get in there and look for stuff to highlight that. How do you feel about that? Do you think it tarnishes the feeling of it? Or do you think it's good for people to know some of the backstory of what went on? Well, I've been misquoted in some of those videos that I've seen on, on YouTube. And that upsets me. And I write in the commentary, I never said that. Who, so, who told you I said that? So it, it is upsetting. Look at again. So set that record straight on the Jim Masters show, the ga the Stage is yours. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the truth is, again, we're all complex human beings and nobody gets along with everybody 24 hours a day. That's insane to even assume that. But to uh, focus on the negative or to uh, make it more negative by putting a more negative slant on a negative situation. It, there's, what's the point? You know, I mean, Elizabeth Montgomery, you know, I wrote very honestly about her in um, my Twitch Upon a Star book. And then when I was one of the executive producers on the Reels Channel's documentary about Elizabeth, I wrote or, uh, you know, I made sure that we told the story of her life as honestly as possible, but with dignity. You know, that's a real important word. So yeah, you can talk about the complexities of a person, of a celebrity. And usually that celebrity, because they're in the public eye, whatever issues they have are exacerbated and made, you know, larger or whatnot. But you can do all of that without making it, you know, uh, exploitive or hurtful or mean-spirited. There's ways to do it as long as you do it with dignity. There was something I saw earlier today that um, for some reason I was thinking of you immediately. I've always loved Bewitched and Genie and all these shows we talk about. Grew up on it. I have a huge uh, passion for them like you do as well. And then I saw one that came up and it was about, you know, Bewitched in a way that made it seem like they all hated each other. That Elizabeth absolutely hated Dick York and wanted him off the set. And it wasn't necessarily because of the injury. It's because he had a love affair interest in his mind with her. And, and that Agnes Moorhead was really a tough, mean, miserable person. And it was chaos and, and a nightmare scenario on that show. And 
uh, not a happy set and a lot of hatred and all this other stuff. And it's, it was out there and I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, uh, gee, it's, I don't know if I want to hear all this. No, it, that's all baloney. And that is absolutely baloney. I mean, Elizabeth knew exactly how important Dick York was to that show. And Dick York left because of his, um, his back ailment. He wanted to stay. Everybody wanted him to stay, but it just couldn't happen. Uh, he, and he, at one point he told me, had he been given that summer of 69 to recuperate before Dick Sargent came along, he would have, uh, he would have, but ultimately he knew for the show to survive, he would move on. He would have to move on. And Dick Sargent called him. They were friends. Yes. They had been friends. Dick Sargent called him and said, is it okay if I do this? Are you going to be okay yeah. with this? So it was that kind of thing. As far as Elizabeth and Andorra or Agnes Moorhead in any competition, my gosh, there are two amazing actresses who had a great respect for each other, just like Mary Tyler Moore and Valerie Harper, but they were close and you don't always get along with people you are close to or who you see as a sibling. Certainly, I'm sure they had their differences, but that didn't mean they didn't love each other. So, you know, again, it's how you look at it and it's how you present these things, you know, that that transpired and not taking the salacious uh, perspective. You've had an opportunity to be uh, on Golden Girls and uh, Stand In Dancer and the 80s music series Solid Gold as well. And a former NBC page. We had Shelly Herman on with her book as well. Uh, and that's with The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. Did you, were you a page at the time that Shelly Herman was too? No, I was, um, I'm, I was later. I think she was in the late 70s or something. I was in the 80s. Um, yeah, that was great. But what kind of experience did that give you? It was it must have been extraordinary. I absolutely loved it. I worked as a bellman at the Marriott Hotel um, in Rochester, and that was my first big public relations job. And I worked in the lobby, and it was such a beautiful hotel. And it really primed me for that guest relations job at NBC. That's really the official title of NBC Pages, our um, a guest relations representative. Uh, as opposed to just, you know, an NBC page. And I like to say intern too, because it always makes me sound like I was a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but that job was yeah. just the best. Everybody who was anybody in the 80s went down that Johnny Carson hallway. And I worked at Tonight Show mostly every night. Farrah Fawcett, John Travolta, Cindy Lauper, Paul McCartney, you know, Lucy. Everybody right. was yeah. right here. They'd go. I remember when Paul McCartney came by, it was like the entire employee uh, staff of, of the entire building at NBC was in that hallway. And he walked by and we all went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all at the same time. It was hilarious. <laughs> and of course, Bob Hope's usual visits. Oh. Uh, the yeah. Bob Hope. I actually worked a Bob Hope Christmas special. Did you? You know, you know, and those fake ones, you know, yeah. where the, the fake snow, fake snow, and and there's no location. It's all in the studio. I had grown up watching those, yeah. and to actually work one, mm. what an amazing thing! Which, by the way, is going to be all be covered in my next Christmas book, which is coming out next year, called Christmas TV Memories, oh, um, wow. which is about the animated shows, the TV movies, the specials, and the episodic all Christmas of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, with a little bit of the other eras. That's fantastic. So all the Rankin Bass productions, all of Absolutely. those, huh? Yep. Wow. Can't yep. wait for that one. House Without a Christmas Tree. Best yes. ever. Yeah. Wow. That's going to be terrific. That's fantastic. Yeah. So you're you're getting ready to write that already? I'm writing it as you're doing. Speak. You are. Wow. I'm writing right now. You can't see. But no, I'm no, writing. we don't. We don't. We don't see. Right. Exactly. <laughs> he may have pajamas and slippers on, too. You, it's, maybe I do. You just don't know. We're not going to. There will be no panning or tilting of cameras down. That's for sure. <laughs> not on the Gym Master Show. Um, you're also you did. a Is it a revamp of the six million dollar man? Tell us about that, too. That's exciting. Yes. This is the 50th anniversary of the six million dollar man's uh, debut as a TV movie in March. 
1973. And then as a monthly series, it began um, in October 1973 as one of the alternate episodes, really, of uh, the ABC suspense movie, which was like a weekend version of their movie of the weeks that used to be on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So yeah, it was time to reboot that to reboot that bionic book. So I have a special commemorative edition of it. And we have a new foreword by uh, Terrence McDonald, who is one of the writers on The Six Million Dollar Man. And yes, I'm very excited about that book as well. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's got a great new cover, new photos inside, new anecdotes, and a lot of revisions. And you can see it all, of course, at HerbieJPilato.com. All the books, just everything is there. It's really a fantastically created website. Has anybody ever done a book or anything on Aaron Spelling, such a prolific producer in the 70s and 80s? Um, I, I, I did an article about all of Aaron's shows in the 70s. For a local paper back in uh, New York, but I don't think so. No, there's never been. There might be a general thing on him, but I'm not. I'm not really sure. And by the way, Bob Barnett is my mar is my marketing director and the website designer of my website. So it's it's because of him that that website is so fantastic. I wanted to make sure. I said that. Yes, and of course, for those joining us late, you you did a wonderful. Tribute to uh, Mary Tyler Moore, who we still miss. Every time you see the the reruns, you're like, oh, I cannot believe she's gone. And she's, of course, her final resting place is in Fairfield, Connecticut. And we lost her at age 80. Yeah. What was that like uh, penning that book? Well, Mary, I, I wanted to do a follow-up in the classic TV female biography sector to my Twitch Upon a Star book. And Mary and Elizabeth both had such similarities. They both had demanding fathers who did not want them to get into the entertainment industry. They both felt uh, stereotyped by their TV roles, uh, Laura Petrie and Anne Mary Richards with regard to Mary Tyler Moore. But they also both came to um, a certain piece about those roles before they passed. And they were like, okay, Mary Richards and Laura Petrie aren't going anywhere. Samantha isn't going anywhere. I better deal with this because people love me for those roles. And so it was so, so similar. So I knew that that would, and I'd always loved the Dick Van Dyke show and the Mary Tyler Moore show, not as much as Bewitched and whatnot, because Bewitched is a separate entity. Um, but I knew that one day I always wanted to do the Mary book. And again, she had done two books of her own. So what was the challenge? How was I going to make that different? And there's this whole 10 year period of her life um, before, or after her last book and before she passed, that was not covered, you know, with her TV movies. And I made sure that my book would include that. I mean, I talked to all kinds of people for that book as well. So, yeah, she was an amazing person who did not love herself. Mm. She was mm. doing that plastic surgery, the new teeth, the new cheeks. You know, it was just not necessary. And she lost that natural chipmunk look that she had. That was just adorable. She got rid of all that for that, you know. For that, I want I want the cheekbones look. And yeah. It was not necessary, and I think, in my personal opinion, that had she not had all those surgeries, you know, when you have a, any kind of surgery, elective or not, it affects your mind. You know, you yeah. go under the knife, you go under the anesthesia. If she would have just left herself alone, not to, not to mention that she was a diabetic mm -hmm. and that she was an Type alcoholic, yeah. and mm -hmm. surgeries for diabetics and alcoholics are not good things. If she would have left herself alone she would still be with us. I really believe that. You know, sometimes when I would see her in interviews, um, I wasn't sure if she was comfortable in her own skin. There was just something that I, the vibe, something in her eyes that I got that uh, in some of the interviews. And again, she experienced a lot of tragedy in her life too. Okay. So some of that I'm sure, you know, was expressed. You can see it in the eyes when somebody is sad. But I, well, I did, I did, with all the joy and fabulousness she brought us, I always felt that there was just something that was there. Did you get yeah. that too? Oh, absolutely. I, I think as you know, I traced it back 
to she was sexually abused when she was a little girl, like in in her one of her early early residences, um, in a, in a an apartment building. There was a neighbor, I believe, who had sexually abused her, and she never dealt with that because in those days you didn't. You know, it was not something that was some that was encouraged. You just dealt with it, and I think that contributed to a measure, uh, statistically, according to various science. And you know, and, and and pediatricians and all the the research that has been done with sexual abuse that affects you, you know, with a with a great deal of of, of self hatred. So I don't think she recovered from that, and I think that's also why she started drinking. In addition to losing her brother and her siblings and her son, yeah. you know, that that it was just she just had a tough, tough life. People would say to her. I really loved Mary Richards. Oh, I, I so wish I could be like her. And Mary would say, yeah, so do I. Right. You know? you know, it's kind of like Florence Henderson, where a lot of people would say, oh, my God, you were the perfect mom on the Brady Bunch, and we love you so much. And and I'm sure you did, too. I had an opportunity to meet her on several occasions, chat with her at various events, and she was Nothing more than what you would always hope. Warm, funny, affable, approachable. But she she would always say in interviews when people would, you know, shower her with praise about how fabulous she was as a mom and almost uh, a whole generation growing up with her as kind of like their mom, a, a TV mom, of course, that she wishes she had a mom like the one she portrayed on the Brady Bunch. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Florence. Well, what I loved about Florence was her unaffected personality, you know. Um, so she kind of whatever issues that she had, she didn't and wasn't embittered by it. You think you it's know? a Midwestern trait coming from Indiana? Possibly, possibly, you know, because there's two different ways you can go when you have trauma in your life. You know, you either, get, you either rise above it. And you get you grow stronger because of it, or you get bitter about yeah. it and you don't deal with it. Right. And I think that's kind of what Mary did, where someone like Florence rose above it, you know? Yeah. And Florence, by the way, was a fellow student of Elizabeth Montgomery at the New York Academy of Dramatic Arts. And that, I, I didn't know. That's cool yeah. information. And I interviewed Florence for uh, for the book. And she said she would always look at Elizabeth and she's like, oh, she's so beautiful, you know? And then when, you know, they were doing the Brady, she was doing the Brady Bunch and Elizabeth was doing Bewitched, they connected again. So it was really cool. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's amazing the, the amount of things you've had an opportunity to be participating in. And then, of course, then again with Herbie J. Pilato. Yeah. That was a lot of fun too. And Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime UK, Shout Factory TV. I mean, this was all over. Yeah, that was a dream come true. That was a dream come true. And I will be forever grateful to uh, Joel Eisenberg and, and Lori Gersh Eisenberg for, for picking me out of semi-obscurity. And 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 because they discovered me at my live events at the yes. Burbank Barnes & Noble, which I talked about earlier. And they had been following me and they said, we want to turn this into a show. To a show, yeah. It was a dream come true. I mean... It wasn't the biggest show in the universe. It wasn't on ABC or whatever. But it was but, well produced. But it, it was, was yeah, it looked really nice. Produced. Nice set and everything. I nice, uh, had I interviewed, you know, great lighting. <laughs> great lighting. I love that lighting. Absolutely. And you know, Dark Shadows and Burt Ward, the people from Dark Shadows, Burt Ward, Ad Asner. It was terrific. You know, I uh, didn't get get a chance to ask you this last time. And I know one of the folks who was a guest on that show, and we did a tribute to her as well. I had an opportunity to meet her on several occasions through a mutual friend, Dan Goggin, who created Nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was at a time when she was in Nonsense. And when we did that tribute episode, we had Tracy Reiner, for those watching, Penny Marshall and Rob Reiner's daughter, Carl Reiner's granddaughter, and, and several other folks that were with us. And it was Cindy Williams. Tell us about Cindy Williams from your perspective. Oh, she was a sweetheart. When Cindy Williams passed away and Tony Dow passed away, those two people who I was privileged enough to, to call friend and just were the sweetest, most down to earth people, broke my heart. Cindy would call, I, I would call her and say, Cindy, could you do this? Could you come here? Could, absolutely, whatever you need. Could you write a blurb for my book? Sure, Herbie. 
I mean, she was the best. And that she was the first um, celebrity that I interviewed at a live event at the Larry Edmonds Bookstore, which is that fantastic bookstore in the middle of Hollywood. The manager of that bookstore called me up and says, Herbie, I'm doing, uh, Cindy Williams is going to do a book signing. Would you want to come and interview her? And, you know, for the, be the moderator. I said, absolutely. So when I first met her, she's like, oh, hi, Herbie. And it was like, just yeah. from that moment on. That, that's all it took is hello. Yeah, the way she made you feel so like, just you guys are in the room, right? Absolutely. And it was real. It was genuine. Getting chills. I'm getting chills. Yeah, it was, it was genuine. Chill. She was the best. Yeah. And then I actually got to sit down that day and watch an episode of Laverne and Shirley with that crowd at uh, just like there were like 30 or 40 of us watching with Cindy. Can you imagine watching Laverne and Shirley with Cindy Williams? It was just an amazing thing. I never got to do that with Elizabeth and Bewitched. I did that with Dick York and Bewitched. We watched did you? Uh, Thanksgiving to Remember was the uh, Bewitched episode that we watched. And that was an amazing thing. But I never got to do that with Elizabeth. Do you think Dick York was appreciated for his talents? He was a brilliant actor. He was so funny and physical in Bewitched and other things. Oh. He was amazing. Um, I always appreciated it. When I, when I was a kid, I thought he was too animated. It was too much for me, you know. But as I grew up and realized just what he was doing on that show and how he was making every scene work was kind of amazing. I mean, it wasn't kind of amazing. It was amazing. Dick Sargent was a super guy. And by the time, you know, he came to play that role, you know, Elizabeth said the character of Darren was less uh, shocked by what was going on. So his more sedate performance really fit the character of Darren as it moved on. But Dick York was just amazing. No other word. No other word. Something that I think we, I don't know if we talked about it last time, but I really think it's so important to bring in. And I think it's a spectacular thing that you created. Back in 2013, you founded the Classic TV Preservation Society, mm. a formal 501c3 nonprofit organization that's dedicated to the positive social influence of classic television programming. Now, I like that line right there, positive social influence of classic television programming. Because I think a lot of times, and working in the industry as well, that television gets a bad rap. You know, they, they just say, oh, don't watch television because you, you know, you'll get all these negative uh, vibes and all this other stuff. But when you watch these shows that you're focused on and these shows that you know we're talking about now that I love, you love, and many of our viewers love, the positive social influence of the classic television programming is exactly what it is, right? And thanks for creating an organization like that. Thank you. Thank you. We, I wanted, I was, again, it goes back to be which I was inspired by Elizabeth Montgomery's charitable ways. So I wanted to form a, a nonprofit organization that was dedicated to that, um, you know, that positive influence and the core function are the classic TV and self-esteem seminars that I bring to schools and colleges and community centers and business centers and senior centers, especially the senior centers, where I talk about and I show sc I screen episodes of classic shows and whatnot. During the pandemic, things kind of, you know, died down with that because you couldn't make personal appearances. But now I'm rebooting that classic TV preservation society. And the retroactive television book really is a book about all of that, how People became um, uh, doctors. Be Some people became doctors because of Marcus Welby, MD, or ER. Uh, some people were inspired to become lawyers because of Perry Mason. Some people, some families learned to communicate on a more positive level or in a more positive way because of the Brady Bunch, the Waltons. So these classic shows, you know, it's not like they set out to uh, teach you, you know, okay, here, this is how you be a better person. This is how you be a better person, or this is how you can be a better parent, or become a a, a female journalist in 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 TV because of Mary John Marsha. They didn't set out to do that, but that's what happened on a, either a subconscious level uh, or not. It happened, so I wanted to explore that. And the Classic TV Preservation Society speaks to that, and my book Retroactive Television 
uh, certainly expands upon all of that or expounds upon. It. There's the website. We can get that and uh, everything else. Of course, all of these things are available where books are sold, Amazon and everywhere. So check it all out. Um, was there ever a show that influenced you to the point where you wanted to do what the characters were doing? Like there were a lot of people that wanted to be astronauts because of Tony Nelson on I Dream of Genie. A lot of people wanted to be script uh, joke writers because of the Dick Van Dyke show. I actually got interested in, well, I always loved it anyway, but Mike Brady being an architect on the Brady Bunch at that time, at that age, really sort of piqued my interest. And I studied architecture and design while also studying this industry of broadcast and television, radio and all. So that did have an influence. How about you, Herbie? I, I I don't think that I had any specific, um, you know, uh, position in mind, except what I've done. You know, it, it classic TV gave me this life, this thing that I'm doing now. Everything that I loved led up to the TV show, the books, you know, the, in the return to acting. So it all inspired me in general to leave Rochester. You know, and I didn't listen to the the negative talk. Oh, you'll never get out of Rochester. You'll never go to college. You'll never work at NBC. You'll never meet Elizabeth Montgomery. You'll never do the Bewitched book. Oh, no. I just ignored it all because I felt driven and inspired collectively by those shows in that way. You know what I mean? Not to go be a, a, a superhero or a... Or, or, or maybe an, arch an architect in that way, or a doctor. I never watched Marcus Hobie said, I want to be a doctor. But something else was going on with me that I wanted to do something collectively. And I've done that. So, yeah. yeah. So it had such an influence where you wanted to really celebrate it, lift it, and uh, share it with people in the way that you have, which continues to be really fantastic, Herbie. Uh, I wish you nothing but continued success doing it. And congratulations on all of the epic books thus far. And, uh, and they're know. all available in audio book now, too. Uh, and do you narrate uh, your narrative? I narrate the uh, retroactive television book. I narrate the introduction to Twitch Upon a Star. I narrate the introduction to Connery, Sean Connery. And then somebody else has handled the Mary book. But those... Those uh, five books there are all on audio, which I'm very, very excited about. We've talked about some of the other books uh, in depth previously, but with this latest Connery, Sean Connery, what do you hope the reader is left with? Whether they're a Sean Connery fan, fan of the whole James Bond you know, uh, franchise, or just love epic stories about amazing, iconic actors and people in these industries. I want the reader to walk away with compassion for Sean because I do think he had a bad rap and you know all of a sudden he had a bad rap after years of people absolutely loving him then all of a sudden he was attacked and I thought that was unfair um, and I cover believe me all sides of the story you know I'm not really sure what happened between he and his wife oh, nobody's sure what happened between he and his wife but he and his wife and I point that out in the book so I really want anyone to who reads this book to walk away and say, this is a very objective book about his life, about this man who made a major contribution, who was loved and he had some issues and that's okay. And we're moving on because we all have issues. You know, that's right. That's, that's well said. That's so true. So you, what I like about what you do, Herbie, is you come in when writing these stories, curious, wanting to learn, you don't come in, with a bias or like a, a, a notion of, you know, we're going to get them or we're going to, you know, expose this or whatever. There's different things you'll, of course, relay because it's part of the history, mm -hmm. but you're very good at uh, doing it in a way that uh, is non judgmental and, and, and unbiased. You leave it to the reader to come up with their conclusions based on your research and detailing of it all, right? Yes, I do. And thank you for seeing that, Jim. Yes, I do. I try to be as objective as I can. I don't lose my passion, you know, for the industry in general and my writing. I'm very excited when I when I write about various films or TV shows or personalities or whatnot. But I do step back and I and I look at things like this, not like this. You know, I try to see the big picture 
And um, I want the reader to be as entertained reading the book as they are or were watching one of the movies or TV shows that these people were involved with. So you have any events coming up? I know you're prolific with the book signings and yeah. the talks. Yes. I'm doing a Christmas holiday event Ooh. Um, at the Gloria Gifford theater in Los Angeles. Um, and years in 2015 did a big classic TV holiday event. And that's what I'm hoping this one's going to be this year. So I'm very excited about that. Oh, that's fantastic. A lot of comments coming in. Hello to everybody watching around the world. Here, We're right? Europe and Asia, wow. Philippines, Canada, America, South America. Kathleen's in New York City. The James Bond movies are great. Your book sounds very interesting. Thank you. A uh, number yeah. of people said they're already going to go out uh, to get it. It's online, folks. Grab it. And there's his website as well to learn more about all the other cool things that our very special guest, Herbie J. Pilato, is doing. Always great to have you on the show, my friend. Truly, I know you're very busy. So to have this amount of time with you is a, a real wonderful treat for all of us and a delight. You are welcome back. As I said last time, we keep the porch light on for you. We kept that porch light on. We're going to keep that light on. You are welcome back anytime. And again, if you know more wonderful folks uh, that you'd like to have seen on our show, you you know, Tina Cole, which was wonderful. She oh, was a delightful. She a sweetheart. She was absolutely spectacular. And you were totally amazing. in love with her as a kid. Totally in love oh, with her. Oh, yeah. And she's funny and just yeah. really, if you know others, uh, we'd love to have them here. And uh, I really appreciate that and spread the word about our show. And thanks so much. And congratulations on everything. And let's stay connected. Keep me updated on the cool things you're doing. And we'll have you back to celebrate them, my friend. Thank you, Jim. You're such a nice guy. And thank you, everybody, for all the comments and, and, and bless you all. And happy early holidays. Absolutely right. Absolutely. Get that music going. You be well, Herbie. We'll chat again soon, okay? Okay, Jim. See you later. All right. Take care. The incomparable Herbie J. Pilato here on the Jim Master Show for a second time. This was his return visit, and boy, it was delightful, was it not? Uh, you can have great conversations with him, as we did. I, You know, he's one of the folks with that, when I said we were going to have him come back to talk about the new book, Connery, Sean Connery, uh, we would have a really good conversation, not just about his new book, celebrating Sean Connery, and again, it's a great read, but also going back in time and talking about some of the other books that he penned, Books about Mary Tyler Moore, Elizabeth Montgomery, The Six Million Dollar Man, and on and on. Just celebrating television and movies and history, classic television programming, so much more. He is an author, producer, TV historian, pop culture expert, and an actor. And he's going back into acting. Again, he was on Golden Girls, Solid Gold, many other things. And uh, he's going back to it. That is absolutely cool. If you enjoyed this episode... Do us a favor. We would love it. It really helps our show. Give this episode a like, a thumbs up like. Yeah, it's on the YouTube channel, the big thumbs up. Share this episode on your social media. Leave a comment for us as well. Leave a comment right underneath in the comments section. Interact with us. We would love that. And don't forget as well to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be fantastic. And for all of you who have subscribed, and you have joined us here in support of what we're doing with our Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series. We thank you so very, very much. As we continue to grow, it's extraordinary. We've had thousands of new folks subscribing to our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV, and thousands and thousands around the world watching and enjoying the content and what is being done here. We want to entertain you. We want to inspire you, inform you, educate make you laugh, have a good time with all of these fabulous guests and celebrity friends who stop by Lovety Hall and the Jim Master Show Live series. So thanks to everybody for watching. Thanks to Herbie for being with us for his return visit. And stay tuned, more extraordinary guests, content, and episodes of the Jim Master Show Live series are in the works for all of you and you and you and you, as we always say. Uh, really a lot of cool stuff that's happening behind the scenes here as we continue to grow. Herbie was shocked when I said we've done about 1,010 episodes in three and a half years. I'm still dumbfounded that we have as well. And uh, we thank you for being a part of it. If you've been with us, some of you have been with us since day one, 
We value that. And some of you have just discovered the show, maybe even today. However it is, we welcome you. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again. And uh, we thanks everybody. Thank everybody for all these great comments that have been coming in here as well. Let's take a look at a couple of them. Don't forget, if you ever want to support our show while the show is on live in the JMS Lovely Hall chat room, the chat section on the YouTube channel, you can do that with uh, something that they call super chat, super emoji, super stickers. And those are little things that you can do, uh, super emojis. That's in the chat section. And thanks to all of those who have done that and do that during our shows. That really helps support all of the hours that go into all of these episodes from every, you know, from the ground floor up, just even booking the guest. And then the work begins. The, getting the guest, that's one thing. But then putting the shows together <laughs> and doing them live that's a whole other beast and we love doing it. Um, so yeah. And if you ever want to uh, support what we're doing, even when the shows aren't live, you can do it on any and all the episodes. There's a lot of heart, little heart icon. Looks like a little heart and uh, it's on all the episodes on the YouTube channel. You can click that and that helps support the gym master show that you seem to love so much. Fantastic conversation. Thank you for being here with us this evening. Herbie, all the best to you from Maureen. A little extra screen time there for you, Maureen. <laughs> but you've done super chats, so that's cool. And um, Kathleen Walker, uh, these are some, you know, for those of you who are watching regularly and you see some of these names, these are some of the real faithful regulars who never miss an episode. You know, and if they were on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic or the Pacific, they'd find a way to get some sort of Wi-Fi signal and, and watch our shows. And don't forget, if you ever miss a show live, or you come in sort of in the middle of it and you want to sort of rewind, you want to see the whole thing in its entirety, you can. How? Because we archive everything on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. So you can see everything again and again and again, which is great. We just shared on our social media the episode we did. Thanks, Kathleen. We appreciate that. Thanks for being here. Herbie, great show. Good luck with everything. Thank you. And uh, great show. Thank you, Jim. Thank you as well. We just uh, shared on social media the episode we did with iconic actress, TV legend from Happy Days, Mrs. C, Marion Ross, who today, at the time of this show, this is her 95th birthday. Legendary actress, Marion Ross. Yes, you know from the iconic series, Happy Days, and much more. She's 95. This is her birthday. So we say a very, very happy birthday to our celebrated JMS guest. She was a fabulous guest. Matter of fact, her son, Jim Meskimen, who is a brilliant impressionist, also joined her. And it was from her beautiful home in California. I think it's the, the Happy Days Ranch or something that like that she calls. And she even said during the conversation when she was a guest on our show, and you can see that episode on our YouTube channel. Just go back and binge. Go to Gym Masters TV whenever you want on YouTube and just scroll backwards and you'll see a thousand shows. Even the, some of the very first ones were just me talking to the camera and wearing the hats and the glittery jackets and the disco ball and all these different things we were doing. And uh, we may do a retro show where we sort of bring that back and the cast of characters uh, all the cast characters we've had, uh, we've grown and expanded, you know, since, but we may do a couple of those shows. Got to do a pop-up show, maybe talk to the viewers as well. Uh, probably going to do something with Patreon to help support what we're doing. A lot of people have told us to do that and have asked how can they support us. So we're looking into that as well to keep the wheels turning here at JMS. But that episode with Marion Ross, you can see on the talk about classic television, right? Sort of the theme of this episode tonight. You can see that episode here on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV with Marion Ross. So from me, Jim Masters, and all of us, and on behalf of our faithful viewers watching around the world, a very happy 95th birthday to Marion Ross. How cool is that? Wow, that is amazing. That is amazing. And Sherry Larson, hey, she made it to the end. Sometimes she disappears in the middle. She, there she is. We love it. Uh, thank you, Jim, for another wonderful show. Have a marvelous Thursday. You too as well. She's got some funky Wi-Fi out in the Midwest uh, there. 
Every once in a while that happens. I know Jane says it's hard to believe that Marion Ross is 95. Yeah, she looks like a million bucks. And you can see the episode again on our channel. It was, we had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun when Marion Ross was uh, here. And uh, mm, good stuff. <laughs> yeah, she's, uh, she's talking about Sherry with the Wi Fi. Sometimes she gets booted off, her Wi Fi goes out. Wow, what a busy day today. We did two shows today for those watching live when an extraordinary guest earlier, Grammy-nominated singer, songwriter, composer, A.J. Mathur, was back uh, from Switzerland. And his his first appearance garnered thousands and thousands of views and comments and likes. And just people asked if he would be back. And he's a good friend. And he was with us. Um, and absolutely incredible. People compare him to the Beatles and David Bowie and... Bob Dylan and Jackson Brown in terms of his sound. Uh, you can see that episode. It was earlier today. We did an afternoon episode of our show. And uh, yeah, we've got some amazing guests that are coming on, some major names, big big celebrities, and all kinds of folks from all different backgrounds. Uh, really cool stuff. Really. Now we can eat. I am starving. It is after 9 o'clock at night. It's like the third night in a row with JMS where I didn't get a chance to eat because it's been so busy. We had an earlier JMS episode uh, that we did, but I also had four radio shows to host today as well. I also had to, um, we're headed to Minnesota. We're going on a TV shoot in uh, after Thanksgiving up towards Minnesota from my professional work television show series. So we're going to be going to Minnesota. So we were working on some of the details of that. We've got a big TV shoot this Saturday morning. Um, so it's busy times during the day when you don't see me on, I'm working <laughs> or with family and friends, but, uh, and then we come here and we do these shows with all of you, which is, uh, so we've got the green light to go and eat. Thank you from Sweden. I wish I had some Swedish meatballs. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the double lovity day, Jim. And for those watching uh, saying, what's double lovity? Well, we call the show, you know, sort of lovity hall, the lovity show, uh, because I said the show is a lot of uh, light, love and levity. And then I said, lovity. You've probably heard that a million times, those who watch all the time, but there's a lot of new people who watch all the time uh, or watch for the first time. They don't know what the lovity means. Thank you very much for those uh, great comments there, Maureen, and tight, lovely hugs to you as well. And to uh, Kathleen in New York City and, and everybody that's watching. That's it. That's a wrap for this episode, but don't go anywhere because if you are watching this in the archives, stay right here. Another episode comes up. Binge watch. Don't forget again, like, comment, subscribe, do all those things. We would love that. That means the world to us. And uh, come back and see us again right here on the Jim Masters Show Live, bringing back the Lower Soda Conversation, great viewers from around the world, fabulous guests, live interaction. Boy, we give you your money's worth here at JMS and love doing it. All right. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you on the next one. I got to go eat dinner. It's calling my name. My stomach is getting a little irritated. It's saying, fill me up. So we're going to do that right now. Hopefully we filled you up with some good conversation and entertainment on this episode. We'll see you on the next one. This is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time, coming to you live from Lovety Hall in the New York area in the United States. Be well, love one another, take care of one another. We'll see you on the next episode of the Jim Masters Show Live. Love you all. Cheers. <laughs>